All right, everyone. It is one o'clock and um, just watching our participant numbers coming in. I'm going to wait uh, probably two minutes. We've got uh, some folks signing through now and it just takes a minute to get everybody through the gateway. Welcome. <laughs> about 20 participants. While you're uh, logging in, folks, if you want to in the chat, we would love to know where you are joining us from today. So please feel free to enter in the chat where you are joining the webinar from. I'd love to check that out. <clears throat> We've got uh, someone from Kitchener, Ontario, someone from Dartmouth, uh, Cal Bay, Bedford, Nova Scotia, Vaughan, Ontario, Waterloo, Lewis Head, Porter's Lake, Sprafield, Halifax, New Waterford, Nova Scotia, Another one from Halifax, uh, someone from Rose Bay joining us, someone from the head of St. Margaret's Bay. I'll say hi to Patricia Manuel, uh, who I've got to know a little bit along the way, and to John White, who's, uh, we've talked before, I think, John. And we've got someone coming in from Lower Prospect. And I'm just going to wait another moment. We are, um, our numbers are adding up quickly there. And lots of folks from all over. Um, someone up from the Picto shore. All right. Um, I expect we're going to have a number of people uh, joining us over the next number of minutes as we get started, but I am going to get started now because I'm really excited about today's webinar and want to get right to it. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you're just joining now, please uh, let us know where you're joining from in the chat. Um, today's uh, webinar, well, I should say I'm Nancy Anixon from the Ecology Action Center. I'm the coastal team at the Ecology Action Center. And um, I started this webinar series um, of coastal climate change adaptation options. And um, my reasoning behind starting this is that for two years that I've been doing this work, two and a quarter years now, I've been grumbling the whole time that there was not a lot of information available out there for coastal um, property owners, for coastal community members, and for um, municipalities who are dealing with coastal climate change issues. And um, so, you know, I get a lot of questions on a regular basis. I get people really wondering about stuff. And what I find is a lot of our colleagues know about rock walls and sea walls and anchor stone and not a lot of the other coastal climate change options. And there are a ton of them. So I've started making a list and started doing a webinar series. The one good thing about our changed crazy world these days with COVID is that um, we have more time at home and we're all becoming Zoom experts. So I decided you better stop griping about this and you better do something about it. And so I made a big list of coastal climate change adaptation options. I'm adding to it all the time. Um, as you may know, if you had a chance to check it out, I had a webinar in June with uh, Rosemary Lonis from Helping Nature Hill, and that was focused on living shorelines, which is a wonderful nature-based approach to adaptation along our coast. And today I'm extremely excited to have a colleague of mine who I will introduce in a moment, um, joining us to talk about the Coastal Protection Act for Nova Scotia. And I've had someone say to me just recently, why are you doing an adaptation options webinar on the Coastal Protection Act? But in my mind, the Coastal Protection Act and legislation that stops inappropriate development along our coast is our number one best adaptation option as we move forward. It has a 100% success rate. If we don't put things in dangerous places and we don't 
build structures or put structures, man-made structures in our coastal ecosystems, which are adaptive and resilient and trying to respond to what's happening in Nova Scotia, then we have a wonderful um, adaptation option. So uh, it's my favorite of all of them and I'm very excited about it. Nova Scotia is very innovative. So um, that's why this is included in my adaptation option webinar series. Nova Scotia has a lot to be proud of too. We are an innovator in doing this. There is not specific legislation anywhere in the country and there's not a lot elsewhere in the world that is specifically uh, created with the view to protecting our coastal ecosystems and to stop us from putting things in dangerous places as we adapt to climate change. And here in Nova Scotia, with some of the most grim sea level rise predictions for the country, and um, you know we're on the path for post-tropical storms and hurricanes, we need to be proactive. We need to stop uh, running into the same problem. We need to put our resources into adaptation for those structures that already exist in those communities that are in peril, and we need to stop adding to that list. So, that's why it's, it's in the series. So um, I'm thrilled to have our presenter today, who again, I'm gonna introduce in a moment, but first I wanna do a land acknowledgement. Um, we're gathering virtually today on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, the uh, territory is governed by peace and friendship treaties, and uh, it's really important as we remember our relationship to the land and the environment, and we learn about coastal climate change and climate change in general, that we have the opportunity to uh, learn from the leadership of the Mi'kmaq people and to learn from the original stewards and knowledge holders of our environment. So, just want to make that acknowledgement. Um, very briefly, I'd like to say that our agenda for this webinar today is that we will have a fantastic presentation and then we are going to move to questions and answers. So as you're listening, if you have a question, we'd ask you to please use the Zoom question and answer feature. And when John is done his presentation, I'm going to be managing those questions and asking them to him. And um, so please use the Q&A feature to put your questions in as we go along. And now I am delighted to introduce my colleague, John Summers. John is Nova Scotia Environment's Executive Lead on the Coastal Protection Act. John has been working in the provincial government for 30 years. He's done work with um, uh, economic and rural development and tourism, with the Office of Policy and Planning, and with Labor and Advanced Education before he came over to Nova Scotia Environment and uh, took the lead on the Coastal Protection Act. His uh, current focus, John's current focus in his role is to work with others in Nova Scotia environment with other staff and with other provincial departments to develop the regulations for Nova Scotia's Coastal Protection Act. I can say that it's been a distinct pleasure to work with John for the last several years. The Ecology Action Center harangued everyone who would listen for more than a decade saying, we need to protect our coastline, we need to protect our coastal ecosystems, we need to stop putting things in dangerous places. And um, I happened to come into this work not long after John entered his role and John has been collaborative and open and I've learned a great deal from him and it's been a, a delight. And you know, it's not always easy to work for an environmental charity and try to work with a provincial environment um, department, but um, I've had a, a real great time working with you, John, and I'm delighted that it's you who's leading this charge. So um, I will now turn it over to John for his presentation. Okay, Nancy, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, I'll share my screen and thank you very much for your, uh, for your kind words. Okay. All right, uh, maybe uh, someone can just tell me if that's uh, visible now. That is visible, John. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. And thank you uh, for this uh, great opportunity to uh, talk to Nova Scotians about the work we're doing on developing uh, regulations for the, uh, for the Coastal Protection Act. Uh, I, plan to talk for about uh, uh, 20 minutes and then hopefully leave ample time for uh, questions and uh, discussion. And 
today. Uh, we'll cover it at fairly high level, uh, but we'll we can go into the weeds in some places if you like, but I uh, want to just provide an overview of the uh, of the act, which you'll see is a, it's not a long act. It's a, more of a framework and it's the regulations that will, uh, where the rubber hits the road basically. So we'll talk a little bit about the act, uh, what its purpose is and uh, how it's structured. We'll talk a little bit about shoreline structures and their impact on coastal ecosystems. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, vertical and horizontal setbacks, which are the main regulatory tools upland of the ordinary high water mark uh, that we pl plan to implement and just kind of close off with uh, who really needs to know about the Coastal Protection Act and, and, and why and when. So, um, First of all, the uh, Coastal Protection Act uh, was passed in, uh, in uh, uh, 2019, 2019, spring session of the legislature, it passed with all party support. And so while the act has passed, it has not yet been proclaimed into law. So it, that means it isn't in effect yet. And what we're doing there is we're, uh, before it can be proclaimed, as I said, the act is more of a framework it's the regulations that make it implementable. And so we're working on, uh, on regulations. We thought it would take us around 18 months. It, it may be a little longer. I know from where I said, I still see several uh, months more of work to go. And while the act isn't a long act, it is complex to, um, it's a complex regulatory uh, puzzle to, uh, to sort out. There are um, a lot of challenges that we're trying to meet with this act, but it works through other legislation primarily. So there are a lot of interlocking, sorry, interlocking parts. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary effort, involves geomatics, uh, climate science to an extent, uh, geology and erosion, uh, 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 land use planning, and of course, uh, as always with these things, uh, government policy. And so it's my role to lead the development of these regulations. I work with a team in Nova Scotia environment, uh, but we also have uh, team members in other departments such as energy and mines, uh, municipal affairs and housing, and also lands and forestry and others, agriculture in there as well. So my role is to lead uh, development of those regulations within the confines of the, or within the uh, authorities of, of the act. So, uh, Find I'll, I'll confine my comments to the uh, to the mechanics of the act and how we see it working. Um, of course, it's elected officials that uh, approve the, the final uh, uh, regulations, so I'll resist the temptation to make uh, policy decisions on the spot in response to your questions, uh, and uh, and also to predict exactly what the regulations will be. For instance, we don't know what the setback distances will be yet. We've got some more work to do on that. And I'll, I'll also, I'm not in a position to really comment on specific, um, uh, 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 specific files or projects that are underway or specific properties. And I'm not, a, I'm not a compliance person or a municipal official. So just with that in mind, uh, I think that'll, um, I, I hope that kind of helps uh, with the scope of our discussion. So the purpose of the Coastal Protection Act is to prevent or restrict development and related activities in places where it will damage sensitive coastal ecosystems. So things like salt marshes, barrier beaches, things of that nature, or where the property that's, or the construction that's built will be at risk from inundation or coastal erosion. So as Nancy said, it really is a coastal adaptation uh, strategy piece. And within that, uh, uh, within that category, I think it could probably best de be described as avoidance. So let's stop building in places where uh, it's going to be uh, uh, going to be vulnerable. So uh, I mentioned that we're developing regulations. We uh, and it's all a bunch of interlocking parts. The regulations have to have structural integrity. It's not like some regulations where there are long multiple lists of do's and don'ts. There of course will be some of that, but all these pieces uh, work together as, as you'll see in the, uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation. So we're working on regulations that address uh, the delineation of a coastal protection zone. And we'll talk about most of these in, in, uh, in a little bit more detail and open to questions on the others at the end. 
a shoreline structure standards uh, standard. We're working with, on that with our uh, colleagues at uh, Nova Scotia Lands and Forestry. So that's the, the sort of rules that would govern uh, wharves, boat slips, uh, shoreline armoring, things of, of that nature. And then vertical building setbacks. So that uh, it's a gross simplification, but uh, I think as a policy tool, we look at the vertical building setbacks. So that's the how high you have to be above mean sea level. And that's sort of the primary defense against, uh, uh, against sea level rise and, and uh, storm surge. And then a system of variable horizontal setbacks and, uh, and a coastal erosion risk factor assessment standard. So we'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. So simplistically, uh, vertical setbacks to defend against uh, sea level rise, horizontal setbacks to defend against um, sea level rise to an extent, but mainly coastal erosion. And of course, in reality, those things are closely interrelated. Um, then regulations for designated professionals. These are the people who will be designated under the act as, uh, to perform uh, erosion standards. And finally, regulations for municipalities so that they can implement the act on the upland uh, area of the coastal protection zone. So uh, we've got 13,000 plus kilometers of coastline and that equals many challenges. So these are, uh, I mentioned these challenges so you'll understand how they shape the mechanism uh, of the act. So we've got a long convoluted coastline, diverse geology, topography and bathymetry, the, the uh, uh, contours of the uh, seafloor underneath the surface, uh, widely varying tidal amplitudes and conditions and wave exposure uh, can vary a lot. All these can vary within a very short distance on Nova Scotia's coast. And that means a wide uh, range of risk levels, but it's difficult to generalize along a huge stretch of, uh, of coast. There are many stakeholders with diverse short and long-term interests. And what I'm talking about there is if you are selling a piece of land or buying a piece of land or you have a pipe dream and you're, you wanna live really close to the water uh, or you're a broker or something of that nature, <coughs> excuse me, your perspective may be different from uh, a longer-term planning perspective or an environmental protection perspective. Uh, so uh, those, things, those are things we have to be aware of. Of course, the coast is a uh, uh, multiple, uh, there are multiple overlapping regulatory regimes and jurisdictions. I don't know if um, uh, anyone from the co um, East Coast Environmental Law is on the, uh, on the call today, but they did an excellent piece called Who Owns the Coast? And that's a great read that explains just how complex it is uh, with, uh, in terms of regulating uh, coastal areas. And that's kind of shaped our approach to try to avoid regulatory duplication or outright uh, collisions. Of course, we need some exemptions and exceptions uh, to the CPA rules. Uh, and we can talk about uh, those in a bit, but there are exemptions for uh, activities or structures that are governed by other uh, legislation. There's an exemption for uh, public infrastructure. You need to do things like build bridges uh, right in the coastal protection zone, of course. And uh, there are exemptions for uh, business where direct access to the water is a functional requirement of the business, like a marina or a, um, uh, a marine renewable energy um, uh, installation, something of that nature. We also want to minimize regulatory burden, and this benefits all, all parties. So the people, people who want to build near the coast uh, to try and keep it as simple so we don't have a net new uh, permitting regime. We also want to make it e as easy as possible to, uh, for municipalities to implement the portions of the act that they're responsible for implementing. And in general, I think all governments are looking to, uh, to control costs. So that has also shaped our approach. All that said, the risks to property in vulnerable areas, uh, coastal areas are real and, and they can expect to worsen over the coming decades. And uh, we, there's lots of examples of where we've tried to fight the sea over the long term and in the long term, the, um, the sea inevitably wins and the costs of, of defending your property are sometimes beyond the, uh, uh, the means of individual uh, landowners. So let's talk about, first about the coastal protection zone. So that's pertinent to this discussion because it's within that zone 
that the rules or the regulations of the Coastal Protection Act will uh, um, uh, will apply. So, uh, simplistically, the the Coastal Protection Act will straddle the ordinary high water mark, and so that's typically the highest tide of the year. It does vary. There's some uh, um, surveyors and uh, solicitors and realtors can argue from time to time about, and landowners about exactly where the ordinary high water mark is on their property, but it is a term that's fairly widely used and recognized. So the act gives us the authority to delineate a coastal protection zone on either side in the areas immediately adjacent to the ordinary high water mark. On the, on the seaward side, we're not interested in regulating all the way to Ireland. It's really more about the uh, structures that happen on the ordinary high water mark or just to the, uh, in the intertidal zone, that sort of area. And on the upland area, the width of the coastal protection zone will be set out regulations. As I mentioned earlier, I don't think I've done a presentation where someone doesn't ask me how wide I think that's going to be. Um, we, we just don't know yet. We're, we still have more work to do on, what, on uh, what's, what seems reasonable. And there are a lot of, that's one of the key questions uh, that uh, we're working on now. There are other uh, complex issues that we're working to sort out. How do we delineate around com complex shoreline shapes like estuaries? How far up rivers do we, do we go? What do we do with barrier beaches? Uh, they, you can see this example from the, uh, from the Eastern shore, and you can see that that's pretty complex. What, how do you actually uh, achieve the uh, purpose of the act in those uh, cases? What about coastal wetlands and marshes? How do we delineate around those? Get a lot of questions about how are we going to deal with already developed downtown waterfronts. In a lot of cases, those are the economic engines for, for communities around uh, Nova Scotia. So we need to think, do we need special rules there? How do we, how do we deal with that? And finally, another, uh, a, a huge enabler for us, uh, if the timing lines up, will be digital mapping. So uh, the province is in the process of, uh, um, creating digital maps for the entire coastline uh, with, with LIDAR, and that will make our job easier, make uh, it easier for the people who are being regulated so they can see where various uh, uh, boundaries are. It'll make it easier for municipalities in making decisions about whether the act applies or not, or whether someone's above the minimum building elevation. And so we're tracking uh, with uh, Service Nova Scotia GeoNova very closely how that is uh, progressing. So how will it work? Uh, so this just sort of a, um, an overview of how, the, how we believe the act should work. Uh, hopefully you can follow my cursor here, if we call that the ordinary high water mark. For, and I've mentioned that the Coastal Protection Act uh, doesn't contain any new permitting regimes of its own. It works through other existing legislation and municipal processes. So to the seaward side of the ordinary high water mark, uh, that's where it's, uh, Typically, structures built along there require a Crown Lands Act permit or a Beaches Act permit. And so the Coastal Protection Act will put a regulatory, a regulatory standard in place or some similar device. And the uh, issuance of those permits uh, for things like docks, um, uh, jetties, uh, shoreline armoring, um, boat slips will need to be compliant with uh, uh, with the Coastal uh, Protection Act uh, regulations. Landward of the uh, ordinary high water mark, there are two, uh, two, um, uh, two things that come together to determine whether someone can build there or not. The first one is they have to be above a minimum building elevation. And we'll talk about how we're working to determine what that is. And that's not measured from the ordinary high water mark, that's measured from mean sea level. Okay, so, because uh, we have to adjust it locally for tides. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we're coming up with uh, uh, those numbers in a few moments, but you have to be in any case above that um, uh, uh, minimum building elevation. I say in any case, that means if it's something that needs a building permit. And if you are still in the zone and above that uh, elevation, uh, then you will need a coastal erosion risk factor assessment. I'll, you'll hear me use the word SURFA occasionally, and that is a uh, prescribed methodology that a designated professional and who gets designated will be set out in the regulations. It's a, it's a prescribed methodology they, uh, they will follow to determine whether uh, a reduced setback from that back uh, boundary of the Coastal Protection Act 
is, uh, is permissible. And they'll certify that, and the municipality needs that certificate to issue a building permit. Okay, so just a couple slides on structures and coastal ecosystems. It's always healthy as a regulator to ask, what problem are you trying to fix? And the, this, we'd call this a, a, a bow tie an, a problem analysis. And uh, the, the crux of the problem really two things, reduced ecosystem capacity and accelerated damage to, uh, uh, to built structures. And that should say also to, uh, uh, to natural infrastructure as well. And without going through every box here, over to the right under the impacts, the things we're trying to avoid uh, in the big picture are decreased biodiversity because we're, uh, uh, we're destroying or damaging habitat, higher greenhouse uh, gas concentrations than would otherwise uh, occur because a lot of coastal ecosystems are excellent carbon sinks. Uh, greater negative uh, flood impacts, things like barrier beaches provide uh, natural, um, uh, natural barriers, uh, threats to public health and safety, so public well-being basically cost to individuals and the public from building things in places where ultimately they're going to get uh, uh, either flooded or be damaged uh, by erosion. So our regulatory focus is really on um, specific things that can through it so this cascading trigger of events that can create those negative impacts. So we're trying to uh, structure regulations in a way that uh, avoids putting toxic building materials in contact with the water, like pressure treated lumber and things like that. Direct destruction of, of habitat area through, uh, uh, through infilling. The Coastal Protection Act will not stop all filling, but it, in, it will be able to uh, stop some. Uh, blocking the dynamic movement of the coast. So thinking about uh, things like disrupted sediment transport and, and water circulation, things that allow beaches to re-nourish themselves uh, and, uh, keep that kind of dynamic uh, movement of the coast intact. Uh, trying to avoid things that disrupt ecosystem connectivity and that's both um, uh, from the upland areas uh, right down through the vegetation to the ordinary high water mark and beyond and also uh, along, the, along the shoreline by blocking fish passage and things like that. And finally, although it's a trickier one, increased wave energy reflection that might damage other um, other uh, infrastructure. So the shoreline structure standard, uh, we'll, we're working on that with our colleagues at Lands and, and Forestry now. And I'll just, uh, we've already kind of seen the problem definition and what the focus will be. It will not stop all uh, construction on the coast. It's not supposed to. This is Nova Scotia where people are going to want to build wharves and jetties. They're going to want to maintain uh, shoreline armoring where they have it. Uh, and and things like that. Uh, but the idea is to avoid unnecessary interference with those natural dynamic uh, processes. So it's an important part of the Coastal Protection Act. Uh, you know, early on, uh, we got asked a lot and we asked ourselves uh, this question as well, are we trying to protect the coast from people or people from the coast? And the answer is we're, we're trying to do uh, both things with this, uh, with this act. Uh, and I think I already mentioned that uh, the structures that we're focused on are uh, usually allowed under permits uh, issued pursuant to the Crown Lands Act and or the Beaches Act. And uh, in issuing those permits, uh, lands and forestry staff will need to be compliant with the act. So that's how that part works. And now we'll shift our focus to um, upward, uh, upland of the ordinary high water mark. And the first thing we'll talk about is uh, the, the concept of minimum building elevations. And I'll just check in here to make sure that we're still good and everyone can hear me. Um, but it sounds like we're okay. Oops, sorry, I just go back there. Yeah, your audio is great, John. Okay, it, it, it occasionally cuts out and I find I've been talking for 20 minutes with, uh, uh, to myself. So that's uh, <laughs> what we're trying to avoid there. Uh, so uh, I said, Earlier, simplistically, we try to, we're trying to address the risk of coastal flooding through establishing a minimum building elevation throughout the province. And if you live in HRM, you may be familiar that there is a minimum building elevation called a vertical setback. 
3.8 meters. In a few areas in uh, Lunenburg County, there are, uh, in a number of the uh, districts that have planning, there are um, uh, minimum building elevations. I think it's like 2.5 feet above mean sea level. And in Cumberland County, depending on where you are, there, I believe they also apply there. So it's not a, not a new tool. Uh, the way we have to think about it though, when applying it um, uh, province-wide is a little differently because of the different tidal ranges. So um, I'll just, over on the left-hand side of this, uh, I call this the layer cake of risk, but over on the left-hand side, you'll see terms like one in a hundred year event, uh, one in 20 year event, tidal amplitude, projected relative sea level rise, these are concepts that are probably familiar to anyone that knows a little bit of, or works in planning or knows a little bit about flood uh, planning. So uh, the, our approach to minimum building levels has a bit in common with that, but there's a bit of a departure because we can't do detailed modeling for every part of the province under this act. It would just, it would take us forever. We'd probably never finish that task and the cost would be so what our approach is, is let's try to figure out, first of all, in a foundation, uh, uh, create a sort of foundation uh, uh, for minimum building elevations by trying to establish where the future, use a new term, higher high water large tides. So what that means is that is the average of the highest tides over a 19 year um, uh, cycle. And in most cases, it, well, in all cases, it's a little bit higher than the ordinary high water mark, but the extent that that's, uh, it's higher varies depending on what part of the province you're in. So that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to establish as a foundation. So we need to look at uh, various sea level projections, sea level rise projections. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, determined which specific one we're going to use uh, um, uh, yet, but uh, we'll try and be as consistent as we can with other uh, initiatives within government. For instance, the uh, municipal flood line mapping specification that uh, municipal affairs is working on. And we need to uh, adjust, of course, for vertical land motion. We're not we're not sure whether we'll use uh, one constant for the entire province, which isn't absolutely accurate, but it is simple, or whether we'll interpolate through uh, a number of different points. It does differ from part to part of the province, but the entire range is something like seven or eight centimeters. So um, for our purposes, uh, it may be okay to, to generalize. So you put that together, then you have to consider uh, local tidal amplitude. So that's uh, a huge change. So when you think of the province, you go from uh, uh, say uh, Shelburne all the way up, uh, the eastern shore, uh, right around Cape Breton, through the uh, Fridor Lakes and North Shore, like it, the tidal amplitude doesn't vary a lot. The entire tidal range is around two meters. Tidal amplitude is approximately half of that. So it's only around a meter. So it's not, not that big a difference. But when you start to go from Yarmouth around to Digby and up through the lower upper Bay of Funday, the Minas Basin and into Cobequid Bay, then the differences are huge. And so if you had a minimum building elevation uh, of 3.8 meters in Burnt Coat Head, uh, you're gonna be underwater, even today, you're gonna be underwater twice a day, every day. So that's why we have to adjust for tides. And so we see the uh, minimum building elevation of having a foundation layer based on the future higher high water large tide, and then some sort of a margin, uh, which would be a, a, a very general default sort of, uh, uh, margin of freeboard to compensate for uh, weather events such as a one in a hundred year event or a one in 20 year event. If your municipality uh, in their, as a part of their flood mapping uh, establishes that uh, these parameters need a higher margin of safety, they are totally within their rights under the, this act to, uh, to uh, put stronger measures in place. So how will we communicate that to building officials, to landowners and the public? We uh, will produce a map that looks something like this, won't be exactly like this, but we'll divide the coast up into segments and um, each of the, those segments will have uh, a minimum build, building elevation attached to it. So hopefully it's fairly easy for uh, people to uh, ascertain what the minimum building elevation is. All right, let's move on to uh, erosion. 
And of course, that's a, a big part of the Coastal Protection Act as well. And it's another uh, one of the more technical areas of the act. And the, I mentioned earlier that Nova Scotia has very, uh, very diverse coastline. The wave exposure uh, varies uh, significantly, especially along um, really convoluted coastlines on the South Shore and the North Shore and, and the Eastern Shore. So most of the shores. Um, it's also the geological makeup uh, can change dramatically within a few tens of meters. So you might have a hard oak crop of, uh, of igneous rock and within a few tens of meters, you've got uh, stuff that looks like the, the picture here that is basically a slurry of semi-hardened clay and is highly erodible. So it's very difficult to generalize. We, we do have some mapping resources from um, NRCAN that you know uh, designates entire uh, uh, swaths of coastline as, as being more vulnerable than others. But when you get down to the property le uh, level, it's very difficult to do. So when you're coming up with a default setback around the entire province, we feel to be evidence-based, we need to have some provisions for uh, local uh, adjustments if where conditions weren't. We're not trying to stop people from building uh, too close to the water, uh, uh, for the sake of it, we're trying to do it to avoid uh, certain types of risks. So that, uh, that uh, coastal protection zone provides, in a sense, a default horizontal building setback for the entire coast. And where non-exempt, so things that aren't exempted outright by the act or that don't require a building permit, it's maybe it's, it's a, sort of a trivial uh, a structure uh, like a pagoda or a deck or something like that that doesn't require a building permit. So, um, but when you want to build a house or a building, uh, the erosion risk factors at the property will have to be assessed by a designated professional using a, a prescribed methodology. And just so we're clear about what prescribed means in regulatory language, it means we're being very specific about what that designated professional has to do. And we want to do that to uh, encourage consistency uh, across, uh, across the province because it'll be different DPs doing uh, assessments on different land in different parts of the province for different municipal offices. That's gonna be done at the landowner's expense and uh, the designated professional, uh, the qualifications of that designated professional will be set out in, in regulations. And so the big idea is that municipal building permits will need a certificate from that DP um, uh, to show that the proposed location of the structure is compliant with uh, the act. So a couple of uh, considerations. Uh, we, I'll mention that uh, through a public tender, we hired CBCL, which is a great coastal engineering company uh, uh, based here in Halifax uh, to build the, specific, build the specifics of the, uh, the uh, SURFA tool. And we're in the middle of that now, and I'm very optimistic that we're going to have a, 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 a really uh, effective uh, tool to, uh, for, uh, for DPs to use. And so what it does is it will consider the potential interaction of factors that they can observe on site, uh, such as exposure to wave energy, the sea level rise projections for that area, uh, slope stability and the geological st structure. So figure out how those work together, to determine a site specific horizontal setback. And so uh, um, that's our way of being evidence-based. You know, if you think about the, along the uh, Eastern shore, I think around Lawrencetown Beach or something, you've got fairly uh, uh, gentle slopes with uh, good bedrock, foundation under that, but then you've got these big drumlins of, of loose material that erode very quickly. And that's why we feel a site visit's required and you need to go, uh, you need to hire a, um, a designated professional to go do that. Now we know this puts a cost burden uh, and possibly a time uh, uh, crunch on the, on the landowner. So we know that that process needs to balance uh, the risks that they're trying to mitigate with being efficient and um, and being cost effective uh, for the uh, for the landowner, so that was one of the design briefs to CBCL as they as they began work on the on the surfa. So who's this designated professional? Well, it'll probably be uh, the regulations will 
um, I, I don't like predicting what the regulations are going to say, but the, the concept is that they need to be a member in good standing of an appropriate professional body, which would probably mean in Nova Scotia's case, geoscientists Nova Scotia for uh, PGOs, professional geologists, and engineers Nova Scotia for, uh, for engineers with appropriate experience. They, it is a self declaration type uh, uh, regime. We are not, it is not our intention to uh, certify them or, or act as registrar ourselves. And um, so we've had some uh, discussion with those two professional bodies. Uh, Engineers Nova Scotia will tell you they don't classify, uh, but their code of uh, their uh, members, but their code of practice requires them to operate within the limits of their experience. So that'll be set out in, in regulations and their responsibility is specifically to follow the CERFA methodology to arrive at an appropriate setback from, the, from a rec regulatory schedule. So they'll determine a risk level and that risk level will um, uh, relate to a schedule of predetermined setbacks. And so uh, not to rob them of their professional judgment, but it's a, it's a tool and an approach that enforces consistency across, uh, across the province. So they're certifying that they followed the uh, uh, followed the um, uh, methodology, and that they were qualified to uh, provide that assessment. So they are not, and just zipping to the uh, uh, to the last uh, um, uh, bullet here on this slide, the CERFA is a high-level risk assessment tool. It is not an absolute guarantee of safety. And when the DP signs off that certificate, which will go to the municipality eventually when someone wants to build, uh, they are not signing their life away that they are guaranteeing that that uh, proposed location uh, will be safe for all eternity. They're saying we followed the uh, regulatory uh, standards set out by the province, we're qualified to do it, this was the result. And so the municipality needs to ensure that the proposed construction location, so they typically would get that on a, uh, on a plot plan from a, uh, from a building proponent. And so it's the municipality's job to not to second guess the, uh, uh, the DP, but to uh, determine that the location that's proposed is compliant with both the vertical and horizontal setbacks. So just to close off, uh, you can see it covers a fair amount of, of ground. So who needs to know about this and when? And we still have a lot of work to do on uh, producing materials to, uh, uh, to help the public and DPs, municipalities, and provincial officials to, um, uh, uh, to implement this uh, act. The way we're thinking about our communications planning is like, like this. First of all, who are, who are the stakeholders who are most directly affected when we're talking about implementing uh, the act. So those are folks like land and building owners, developers, building contractors, engineers, architects, uh, designated professionals we were just talking about, of course. Land surveyors in some cases. We don't think this will require a survey, but if a municipality, uh, if someone wants to take uh, issue with a proposed location, a municipality would be totally within their, uh, uh, with their, uh, in a, within their authorities to request a, a formal um, location certificate from a surveyor. Uh, realtors, real, real estate appraisers, lenders, insurers, lawyers, and of course, municipal officials and provincial officials. And there's probably some that I'm either lumping under those categories or we, we haven't thought of yet. And then the other dimension is when do they need to know? So we, we see this as being like when they're doing property transactions. And when I say doing or contemplating, property transactions. Uh, uh, realtors have pointed out to me that in some cases, a SERFA, for instance, may be a, uh, a condition of sale. So someone might need to get it done then. Um, but property transactions when land is sold or, or um, uh, transferred. Of course, a uh, big one when someone is building in the uh, coastal protection zone, uh, they need to know um, uh, about just what every aspect of the act, depending on what, on what they're doing, they need to uh, know about it so they don't uh, go too far in their planning or make too many investments uh, without being sure that they'll be compliant with the act in, in uh, executing their plan. And then finally, uh, land use planning by uh, municipalities and uh, provincial authorities.
agencies and, and developers as well also employ language learners. So I, uh, um, that's uh, talked a little bit longer than I wanted to, but uh, that's the uh, long and short of it. And now maybe I'll turn it over now for, uh, for questions. Right. Thank you so much, John. That was terrific. We have a ton of questions coming in. I'm just looking at our time, so I'm not sure that we're going to get to all the questions today, but I'm going to take a crack at it and see what we can do here. And I just want to say before we move into the questions, um, um, again, John, thank you so much for that presentation. That was excellent. Um, I'm going to be managing the questions today. If anything is off topic, I won't be answering or asking the question. I'll ask the folks to follow up with me after the fact and we can discuss it. Um, this recording of this webinar will be available on the EAC's website and on YouTube. So if you know someone who wanted to participate and wasn't able to, please let them know. And all of you who signed up as participants will receive uh, an email in a couple of days. Um, with the, the webinar attached to it. So um, I just wanted to mention that. So I'm gonna move into these questions and fire them at you fast and furious, John, see if we can get through. Sorry, I went so long. I, I practiced in front of the mirror, but uh, sometimes I get carried away. Actually, that was excellent. Uh, there was some stuff in there and that's, um, I, I learned some new stuff today too. So this was really terrific, thank you. Um, this one may have already been answered in the presentation, but um, Chris asks, how is mean high water or ordinary high water determined? What department, how is it regulated, for example, when a coastal property is armored? And then Chris wrote in later and said he thought it might have been answered during the presentation, but do you have anything to add to that? Chris? Yeah, I don't, I don't think any one department uh, regulates it. We uh, will be using the uh, definition uh, that appears under the Crown Lands Act, which I can't uh, quote from um, uh, uh, memory. But it's roughly equivalent to where the highest tide of the of uh, of the year is, um, and it's it is not a perfect measure. We have also thought about delineating along the higher high water large tide and uh, or creating a line to at least mimic that. That's another possibility. That's a little bit more abstract for people, but it's a line that we can draw on a map. Uh, and uh, Beth asks, so uh, how will having this act differ from the Beaches Act or the Crown Lands Act where there are specific regulations to protect ordinary high water mark, uh, but which the Department of Lands and Forestry is not always willing to enforce or able to enforce? So uh, that's an uh, editorial comment. <laughs> yeah. No, fair enough. Um, well, what a lot of what uh, lands and forestry staff uh, are working off are policies and guidelines. So what we're, uh, as a starting point, we wanna, well, we are building on those guidelines. So I don't have the web reference uh, right at my fingertips, but there's a, um, there are web pages that might be under uh, Department of Natural Resources, uh, the department's uh, old name, but that talks about what you can do on the coast. And so, um, uh, but those are guidelines and and policies frequently. So what this will do is, uh, you know, it'll it'll never be a perfect science, but it will lend uh, regulatory uh, uh, consistency and uh, authority to uh, to those uh, to those guidelines, and it'll make it uh, easier to be consistent across the entire province. Right. Uh, and Eric asks, with respect to the surfa, it covers erosion, but what about general flooding from storm surge? So if you're on a rocky coast with no erosion, does the surfa permit develop permit development like new homes that could flood? That's what the minimum build, great question. That's what the minimum building elevation is for. So it's really intended. It's the vertical setback that's really intended to uh, uh, reduce the risk of, of coastal flooding from storm surge. Okay, and then I'm just gonna jump over. I noticed in the chat, Patricia asked, re related to the vertical setback, the current vertical setback in HRM only restricts residential use in the 3.8 meter setback. Will the provincial standard apply only to residential use as well, or will it restrict other building construction generally for structures that are not necessary for working on or accessing the water, for example, um, Example of structures that don't need to be there are shops, commercial offices, restaurants, galleries, museums, etc. 
It's a great, it's a great question, and uh, we uh, we don't know that yet. So there's a rationale for both things, and uh, it's also possible the act. Um, provides for the creation of subzones within the coastal protection zone. So rules may vary for uh, downtown al already developed downtown waterfronts. Uh, complicated uh, um, uh, issue, uh, but uh, yeah, we're still working on that. Um, now here's a, a Jen Slur question, I think. How are coastal property owners reacting to the act and its regulations from your experience? Um, you know, not that many individual property owners, maybe 10, have, 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 uh, have contacted me directly and it's usually sort of angst about I have a property or I'm thinking of buying one, will I be able to build there or not? And of course, it's, uh, there's not a lot I can say about it other than be careful and if in doubt, hire an engineer and make sure you're, you know, some uh, distance above the ordinary high water mark. Um, I've had... Uh, sort of a, a wider range of uh, questions from uh, just from some of the stakeholders you saw on the on the on the final slide. Uh, I think generally people kind of get it why we're doing this, um, and uh, which is, is is very encouraging. Yeah. And when I do kind of uh, you know we were out around the province uh, last week looking for areas to test the surfa methodology. Uh, and you just see some horrendous erosion risks and in some cases uh, houses that are very close uh, uh, to rapidly eroding banks and wherever you are on shoreline armoring some of these banks are just too big to armor and um, when I see that it kind of tells me yeah it's, there's a reason we're doing this. Yeah that's excellent that's consistent with my experience too for what that's worth I mean I work for an environmental charity so not a lot of people are contacting me and reaming me out about my support of the Coastal Protection Act, but I have had a few folks who have coastal property and had retirement plans or whatever, just asking questions. And of course, as you say, everybody's asking, what's that setback amount going to be so they can plan accordingly? But um, when you really distill this down to what the purpose of this act is, and that is to both protect people and their assets and you know the things they're investing in, you build your retirement home or your cottage or whatever, and then it falls into the ocean, no one wants that and none of us want Want those coastal ecosystems to be negatively impacted by what you're doing so it's hard to object to that I think. <laughs> um, will the regulations include any measures to prohibit removing existing vegetation along the coast? I don't I don't think a par as the part of our act that may be covered off by other um, uh, other legislation I'm not sure but it, it uh, I don't think it's going to be within the scope of our regulations. Okay. Um, we had an interesting question from Ontario. Andrea asks, um, she's wondering if special policy areas or SPAs have been considered for existing coastal development. And she gives an example in Ontario, SPAs were put in place for historical communities already on the floodplain and they are approved by the province. I'd say uh, possibly, but I don't know what the scope. I don't know anything about SPAs, so the scope may be different. But when we look at uh, certain downtown uh, waterfronts that might require different um, different rules to meet all the principles of the Act, uh, it's it's possible. So um, I'd be more than interested in hearing or finding out more about how Ontario um, what exactly is meant by an SPA and. I'm sure that would be valuable information for us to have, yeah. I think I'll connect you with Andrea afterwards. Um, um, so that's a great one to follow up on. Now here's a tricky one. Uh, so can we ensure that there's no conflict of interest between DPs and wastewater QPs, i.e. they have to be separate companies because without that separation, profit interests could distort good process and the appearance of good process? Um. I said at the start, I wasn't going to make up policy on the spot. However, <laughs> that that might be very difficult to implement. And I think our uh, real, uh, so just not making any decisions uh, that are above my pay grade here, but uh, I think the, the, um, the idea is that, you know, it's their professional affiliation and their standing as a professional geologist or, um, 
engineer that's at stake. And so that's one, one thing that discourages uh, that kind of, um, of uh, uh, conflict of uh, interest or reacting to it. And then the, uh, the other thing is the methodology is very prescriptive. And, uh, you know, they have to measure angles and put it on a form that they're signing names on. They have to measure fetch off, off maps and, uh, and they need to classify uh, and analyze the geological structure on, uh, on a site and factor in our projections of sea level rise. So it's, it requires expertise, but it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for fiddling the books. Okay. All right, I've still got a lot of questions here. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, one, call, uh, one associate, uh, Elizabeth, has asked, how does the department plan to communicate the new regulations once they have been finalized? And are there any areas across the province that are priority areas for implementation, i.e. more at risk from coastal erosion or higher development rates? Well, we know we have to develop training for DPs, municipalities, and provincial officials. Uh, I think when we, that last slide, I think I've uh, taken it down, but uh, almost all of those uh, groups uh, are accessible through associations. So we know we have to do, put, uh, um, mount a pretty uh, significant communications uh, uh, plan where so with the exception, uh, and I understand the irony of this statement, with the exception of landowners themselves, uh, uh, we're in fairly constant contact with a lot of those uh, groups anyway. And we know we have to make sure that um, uh, the general public is well aware of this uh, okay. as well. So uh, no specific communications plans to share at this, at this point, although government has said that it intends to uh, consult on these regulations and that will help as well. Um, and someone asks, who are the erosion experts? Will they be newly trained or are they existing engineers or geoscientists? Are you able to answer that or is that still in digital? No, I, we're, well, I, you know, our, our working assumption is that they will be uh, professional uh, geologists and professional engineers who are are acting within their scope of practice. So that probably means that a chemical engineer or an electrical engineer uh, isn't qualified, but a civil engineer with some uh, experience working in these areas or a geotechnical engineer uh, is, um, uh, are, uh, you know, would, would be able to follow this methodology. Okay. And so um, it could be new entrants into that field or uh, uh, people who have been in it for a, with a great deal of experience. Uh, and the methodology is designed, I mean, we're conscious of the sweet spot that the methodology needs to be prescriptive to uh, encourage consistency and objectivity, but it also, it doesn't mean you have to be uh, uh, a geologist and a geomorphologist uh, who has spent your life studying this. It needs to be broader or we will have a problem uh, implementing the act. And it'll be challenging enough, I think, in the early years uh, where uh, the uh, potential DPs uh, recognize the economic um, opportunity of doing uh, performing surface and people finding them. But we're, we're aware of that challenge, so we're, we need to strategize around how to mitigate it. Excellent. And I would say one of my favorite things about what you've done is it's very pragmatic in terms of what you're bringing in new fitting very well with what already exists in municipalities because this will require resources so you know the way you've attached it to existing permit processes and so on makes a lot of sense uh, good to hear <laughs> uh, does it make sense to build a provision into the legislation now that would require an update every 50 or 100 years uh, related to the measure of mean water levels and high, high water level? Uh, it's, it's a consideration, I think, for us to reflect on. I, I, I'm not sure we'll, uh, we'll do that, but uh, it's, it's uh, certainly worthy of consideration. Okay. 
Um, just looking at a question that has multiple parts here, and um, I think I'm only going to be able to dig into one part. So I'm going to say, it appears that the shoreline armoring procedures at present do not have any kind of standard with respect to construction and or location in relation to a common high water mark. Will the new act require an engineered approval armor plan prior to the installation of future armor walls? Likely not. Uh, the focus of the regulations is where are we interfering with the natural dynamic nature of the coast. So it's more from a coastal protection perspective than from a, is it an effective means to uh, protect a property. Uh, now there's a there is a little bit of a caveat there. One of the things we're uh, trying to um, uh, grapple with at the moment is how would a DP um, uh, look at a, uh, an already armored property. So uh, that's an issue we're working on, which is related, but a little bit separate. Through the shoreline structure standard, it's really about where are we interfering with the dyna dynamic nature of the coast and is it, is it necessary to protect an existing property? Is there a better way of doing it? That sort of thing. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question here and then I think we'll wrap it up. We still have a whole bunch of questions, so I, I'll try and capture those and see if there's anything I can do with those after the fact. Um, with respect to wetlands, one of the issues I run into again and again is someone calls me because they live near an area that is pr presumably a wetland. It's all, not always easy to delineate that and they're seeing infilling happening and then someone building on that wetland and I know the process right now is you're getting your municipal building permit and then you sometimes need something from the province that relates to wetland and some from the province for septic. Um, will the act have any impact on that? It can be a bit of a disconnect sometimes when I get these community concerned citizen reports. Will it to affect wetland assessments or wetland building permits or? It, it may indirectly. So uh, um, this is not 100% true, but by definition, uh, no, that's, I was gonna say by definition is not 100% true, but it's frequently the case where salt marshes are very close to mean sea level. So the minimum building elevation may help sort out some of those, uh, some of those problems um, where there will be challenges would be kind of dependent on how we deal with barrier beaches. Uh, so sometimes there are wetlands in behind those that may or may not be connected to the, uh, uh, to the sea and that might affect how far inland the, you know, where the delineation point is for the coastal protection zone. So a bit of a technical answer. I think it will have some effect, uh, but it's, uh, I think we're still working on, uh, on so many pieces. It's, difficult to know exactly how that will uh, uh, pan out. Okay. John, that has been a wonderful session. Thank you for answering all those questions and for your presentation. Again, everyone, you'll get a copy of that presentation sent out to you in a couple of days when it's been edited. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John, for your taking time out of your busy work on these regulations. And thank you for what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And uh, we look forward to, to when the act is in force and we see a, a change in inappropriate coastal development in Nova Scotia. I, I will be having a big party that day and, and every day afterwards. And, um, and for everyone else, thank you for joining us. We will see you in the fall, probably in September, with another exciting um, coastal climate change adaptation option. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody.